Welcome to Tuesday with Terry, the podcast for getting your mind, business, and life in shape. Hosted by Terry Blachek, one of the original area developers for Orange Theory Fitness who helped launch the brand from the very beginning. He'll use his years of experience to help you shape up your mind, build strong relationships with your teams, revamp your business processes, and set down the path towards success in all aspects of your life. Hey, good good morning, everybody. My name is Terry, and you're uh, listening to Tuesday with Terry. What a great uh, a great day here in Austin, Texas. We're talking to you live from Austin, Texas, where the sun is hot, the barbecue is sweet, and all the drinks are free over here, Kristen, if you're uh, hanging out with me, that is. Right. Uh, I'm excited to introduce you to a great friend of mine. Uh, Kristen Brand is visiting us here in Austin, Texas. I asked if she would come on in and uh, get a chance to talk with some of my listeners about the profession that she's in and what she does and maybe offer a little bit of advice for business owners, entrepreneurs, or people that are trying to get started out there. Uh, Kristen Brand is an accountant, CPA, uh, right. fair to say. Yeah. And I met Kristen, I don't know, nine, 10 years ago, probably maybe even more than that. About 10. Yeah. 10 years ago, but who's counting, uh, Kristen? Uh, <laughs> and Kristen helped me. Uh, I had some tanning salons, um, I started Orange Theory Fitness back in Tampa, Florida, and Kristen helped me get the, my accounting in order. She helped me when I started in Austin, Texas with accounting. And so one of the things I thought would be good today was, first of all, maybe just get to know you a little bit and a little bit about your background from, give us the Reader's Digest version, you know, from school, you know, where'd you go to school all the way up to kind of today and how you built your business. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Sounds good. So I went to the University of Florida, go Gators. Um, I didn't really know what all of these different majors were when I was there, but I knew you could get a job if you got an accounting degree. Hmm. So, Do you always like numbers? I mean, were you in, I, in, into numbers? I mean, you like it, you know. Yes. I actually started out in engineering, and that was way too hard. Um, accounting made a lot more sense to me. So, If it ain't making money, it ain't making sense, right? That's, <laughs> that's, our, right. that's our philosophy in accounting, right? So That's right. And at the time I was graduating, um, it was a big recruiting frenzy for public accountants right out of school. Um, and I went to the big four. So you've probably heard of the big four. And I went to Deloitte, which is a professional services firm. It's one of the biggest in the world. And they've got offices in 150 different countries. So that was my training ground. The big four, when you say big four, what you're referring in case if nobody knows what the big four are, those are the big four accounting firms. Um, That's right. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're huge. Do you know who, off the top who so they are? Deloitte. Deloitte and Ernst and Deloitte. Young, 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 KPMG, okay. and Price Waterhouse Coopers. There you go. All right. The big four. You heard it first or right here. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that was really one of the best experiences I ever could have had for training right out of school. Um, I got to work with public companies, CEOs, I, you know, just great training. Um, and what were you doing for those? What did you do for, uh, you know, what, that company? So I did consulting. I did state and local tax consulting. So mm. what that meant was you'd find credits and incentives for companies that were growing. So you'd basically get different communities to give companies money to come and provide jobs. Oh, nice. Good. How long did you do that? I did that for about three years. Okay. Then what happened? Then what happened? I ended up getting recruited by a client. So I went in-house and saw things from the other side. So I worked inside of a business. And, and in their internal accounting department, which is a totally different perspective to see what it's like from the business owner's point of view. And what did you, what was the position that you took uh, when you started? I was in their tax department. Oh, so, okay. you know, I, I did filings, tax filings. Yeah. So, Are you, do you consider yourself a tax accountant? Is that what you can, I don't know if you do or not. I, I'm just curious. Yes, I do. Um, we have, we have a joke <laughs> in the office that tax accountants are boring. And yeah. so, you know. <laughs> Depends on. You're far from boring, asking. Kristen. You're far from boring. I, you know, I just uh, speak for that, you know. But uh, okay, so you do a little bit of in-house tax accountant for uh, one of your customers, and then what happens? And then I came back out and decided to start my own firm. Oh wow, that's that takes uh, some guts, right, to do that? Yes, and sometimes I think it's better when you don't really know what you're getting into. Was, was that your case? Yes. <laughs> So how does that start? You go, I just want to be, I'm going to be, I'm going to be my own accountant. I'm going to have my own firm. I'm going to have my own business. Did you start just by yourself and try to get some clients? How did that, tell us how that started. So what prompted it was I I had a move. I moved back home from Atlanta back to Tampa. Um, So it was, it was an opportunity to start over. And 
I, I started with just one client that needed some consulting. Mm. They, they needed, you know, 10 hours a week. So I said, okay, well, let's try that. And that was just really opened my eyes to thinking differently about work in general. I, I'd always been an employee. And so, you know, doing this gave me space to think about what I really wanted to do mm-hmm. um, and to think about how I was using my time. And then I just started talking with people. And, and I think the, the biggest thing is if you, if you have a conversation and try to solve a problem for somebody, then oftentimes you're hired. I think that's, um, <clears throat> there's lesson number one, I would tell you for today's uh, podcast. How do you solve, you know, if you want to start a business, they say, figure out a problem that needs to be solved. And if you can find a way to solve it, then you probably have a good uh, opportunity for a, a business around that. We talk about that in sales a lot. We talk about don't try to sell a membership, try to solve the problem. The pro- person wants to lose weight. They want to meet other people. They need to get more accountability in their exercise program. So, yeah, help solve a problem. What a great uh, what a great concept. That's exa- exactly <laughs> right. And, you know, I think people are afraid of sales, particularly accountants. Oh, yeah. you're going to make me do business development? I have to talk to people and do sales? No, just ask them what's wrong and try to help them fix it. How'd you grow your business? Word of mouth for the most part, just talking to people and then you make one connection and then they introduce you to someone else. Just trying to do the right thing by people. And then, you know, it, it gets around. Yeah. And then how do you know, like when you get, I guess, you know, because you got too busy, but how do you know when you're growing your, your business and you go, I've got to hire a second person to help me out. And I mean, you know, you have had an office there in Tampa and you had, I don't know, eight people in your office that was, you know, doing everything from tax filings to accounting to you. You had a administrative, you know, assistant receptionist out at the front. I mean, how do you know how to build all of that? What, what, how did, how'd you get through that? How did you learn that? Well, trial and error, right? Um, you, I, I think you need to hire people before you're really ready to. And the biggest thing is keeping them busy so that you've got time to then go find the next thing. If you are maxed out, then you're going to stay there and you're not going to grow. So you've got to focus on what you want to do. And if you're in the weeds all of the time, then you're never going to have time to do that. So you, you, you have your, we open your business, you have your business, you grow your business. And then, then what happens? And then what happens (laughs) when it changes on you again? (laughs) But you've always got to be ready to pivot. How did it change? Um, it, gosh, that's a loaded question. Um, it changed from what we were actually trying to do for our customers to running a business. It was managing the people that were in the business. So it, it became a whole different animal. You know, it's one thing to know accounting or it's one thing to know, you know, fitness or whatever it is that you're in the business of, but running a business is an entirely different thing. Wow. Lesson number two. It's funny. You know, my daughter is, uh, I just graduated Purdue two years ago. She's in veterinary medicine and I immediately start talking to her about, Oh, let's start a franchise. And ultimately I go, you know, she doesn't even know all the pieces and parts of medicine. And so we rethought that and we said, let's learn medicine. And then once you really learn more about medicine and all the different pieces around that and have actual practical application, you're out in the field for three, four, five, six, whatever years, then you can take that and turn that into a business. But you're absolutely right. People in their professions, whether it's accountants, whether it's attorneys, whether it's fitness people, uh, whether it's veterinarians, they all know their book of business but they don't necessarily how to know how to run a business or start a business or maintain or grow a business, right? That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Well, the, great. As I, I want to skip ahead. So you grow your business. A couple of things have happened in the last few years. Maybe share that with the group about what happened. Sure. So we we got the business to, um, you know, we had eight people in Tampa, and it just got to be where our clients started to need more resources. They started to outgrow us. Um, and I really wanted to continue to learn and have have peers and have partners and be part of a team. And so we decided to do a merger with my current firm, which is called Hancock Askew. It's a Florida, Georgia firm, and it's full service. So we did that about three years ago and became a, a, a part of this bigger community, bigger family. So we have about 250 employees now. And we, you know, like you were asking before, I was a tax accountant. And we also do... Um, outsourced accounting for for businesses but the larger firm has all kinds of different things we've got valuations 
you know, mergers and acquisitions work, audits, employee benefit plans, like all kinds of things that you need as your business grows. So was that transactional for you? So when you mer- when you say a merger, you took your book of business and you put it into this bigger firm's book of business. Was was that was that transactional? Was there a fee paid or was that, you know, you got stock in the new company? Just speak to that a little bit. Yeah. So it was all equity. I went from owning 100 percent of a small firm to owning a smaller percentage of a bigger firm. OK. No. So it was uh, <clears throat> like many of the um, uh, mergers are. It's uh, it was more in equity that you got in the new firm, smaller piece of a bigger pie, so to say. Right? That's right. Yeah. People will say, oh, are you retiring no, I'm not retiring, but this is part of my retirement plan. Yeah. So Kristen also does my uh, all my personal uh, tax uh, for my for me personally and uh, for my wife. But um, <clears throat> so what I wanted to do was I wanted to spend a little bit of time asking you some questions and maybe giving some of the listeners some counsel or advice on some of these myth, mythical, uh, oh, I don't really understand that, or what does that mean in accounting? But <clears throat> let's just start with what you said. You talked about your firm, um, Hancock Askew, is, and you said, oh, you talked about full services. So if I were looking, if I'm a business um entrepreneur, I'm a business owner, small business owner, and I need to get an accountant. I, maybe I've been doing my own books. Maybe I've been paying my own bills. Maybe I've been managing my own bank account. If I want to find an accountant, how do I know if I need a bookkeeper or I need an accountant? How would you define that? Well, let's see the difference. So a bookkeeper is going to do um, a lot of transactional work. They're going to take your bank statement and we talk about completeness a lot. They they will take it and turn it into a financial statement for you. And they'll do that periodically depending on what you hire them to do. Um, what they don't do typically um, is any kind of tax planning or tax preparation. And so they will oftentimes refer that out to a CPA firm or or partner with somebody that does those things. But what they do is more limited in scope. So can a bookkeeper pay your bills? A bookkeeper can pay your bills. Okay. Can uh, a bookkeeper reconcile your bank accounts? Yes. Okay. What does that mean, by the way, to reconcile your... I hear, I heard that. I mean, I know what that is today, but what what does that mean? You hear that, you all, they've got, they got to reconcile the bank account. Oh, yeah. And then everyone's like, oh, yeah, reconcile. You know, just, <laughs> let's just roll with that. So, so basically, you take the beginning balance of the cash account. You make sure that every transaction that ran through that bank account is included in the the ledger. So it's just a, a list like, okay, I got, I started with A, all these things happened and then I got to B. So I know that I've captured everything that happened during the month. And then you make sure that your ending balance matches what the bank says. So, you know, you haven't left anything out. Right. Nothing was passed over. Right. So we make sure that the bank statement is actually, actually accurate with what really happened transactionally in the business. Mm-hmm. Is that fair to say? Yeah. And that's one of the biggest things you can do when you're starting out is keep a separate bank account for your business. Treat it like a real business. And that way you can have a bookkeeper produce financials for you. Otherwise, you know, if you're, you've got hair club for men in your business bank account, that's not really part of your business. Why are you saying, why are you talking about hair club for men with me? Like, you know, I know my hairline is receding here, but why you got to bring something like that up today? I, you know, what's going on with that? <laughs> this is my go-to. <laughs> You've got lovely hair. Today. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, play that, play that out there a little bit. <clears throat> so, so if you get an accountant or you get a bookkeeper, one of the pro, you know, if you're an owner entrepreneur and you're doing your own, paying your own bills and trying to get started, one of the, one of the things you do this for is because, you know, you're your own boss, but you also get to control the money, honey, mm-hmm. right? So if you have a bookkeeper and accountant, who really controls the money? How does that work? Well, you need to control your money. That's for sure. Um, you can have somebody do tasks for you, but ultimately you need to have oversight and some controls in place. You can't just say, here's my personal logging, log into the bank account and go for it. I trust you. You know, you, you need to be looking at it periodically and have some um, rules in place about, you know, what are they allowed to do? Um, and, and how do you have transparency into that? Is there a dollar threshold of bills they're allowed to pay? Can you pay everything up to $100 or do you need to sign off on everything over that amount? So in our business at Orange Theory Fitness, we call that an authority matrix. You have authority to spend X amount or pay X amount of dollars. Anything over that needs approval by 
myself or needs approval by the owner of the business, the sole proprietor or somebody, the managing member of the LLC. Um, <clears throat> or uh, maybe in some cases I had this in my, when I started my tanning salon, I had uh, double signatures, mm -hmm. you know, that the uh, bank would require double signatures for certain amounts uh, in terms of paying, paying bills. So you could set, those are kind of the rules you're talking about, right? Yeah. And you want to make sure that it's very clear to everyone what the rules are, have them documented and then you know, follow them and, and look at your financials every month. Look at the general ledger. Look at that, that list of how you got from A to B in your cash account. You can see all the transactions. So you'll catch it quickly. So, you know, this, and I, I say this because uh, this is a worry, right? You're always worried about turning over your bank accounts to an accountant or bookkeeper and then somebody's embezzling money or they're sneaking money out. How do you, how do you catch that kind of stuff? How, how do you, when you say look at your financials, but everybody goes, oh, she cooked the books or he cooked the books. And, you know, you'd never see that, but it happens. It happens. It happens. So how how can you be aware of that or what would you be looking for, you know, to make sure that everybody's on the up and up with you? Well, you need to set the tone that you are paying attention. That's probably the first thing. Um, you know, again, look at your financials. I know I keep saying that, but people don't look at their financials. They really don't or they don't know what they're looking at. Mm. So if you don't know, have somebody show you, teach okay. you, explain what, what it is you're looking at. Um, you know, I've, I've seen a number of of different businesses deal with with fraud one way is to look at your bank statement and examine the signatures on the checks you know is, is that is that your signature terry and you might say oh yeah <laughs> i was you know i was driving a car when i signed this or whatever but you might say no that's not my signature on that check yeah but you know for me because i'm not around all the time to be able to sign checks uh, my accountants got smart on me, you see, and they went and they got these stamps <laughs> with my signature on. Now everything looks like my, it's a, it's a, it's, you know, it's like a stamp that looks like my signature and that's what they're signing all the checks for. Right. So how do you reckon? I mean, I get it. You look at that, but if it's a stamp that are you using, well, that's well, a problem. You need some physical security around that. Who's got access to that stamp and where do you lock it up when they're not using it? Yeah. Um, Who's got that checkbook? Mm -hmm. The other thing you can look at are, we call it uh, flux analysis. What's that? So if you are looking at your profit and loss statement, right, your your revenue, like your whatever your sales are, and then you see a listing of all of your expenses, and they're usually subtotaled. So you'll see, oh, well, here's my marketing expenses, here's the utilities, maybe here are my professional fees. And you look at them from month to month to month, and if you see one spike, you need to ask why. Okay, well, why did my insurance go up, you know, 50% between January and February? Well, it was an annual policy and that's why it hit in that month or you know why did utilities go up well it was 105 degrees in austin today you, know, you, you want to know why and if you can't explain it then you need to dig into it a little bit more yeah i, I tell you i think that's number three is uh you know getting into the details but i think where you find those types of situations happen is when you start looking at the details you're looking at repairs and maintenance and repairs and maintenance begins to price creep and get higher and higher and higher and the next thing you know your accountant has a brand new uh they have a <laughs> a construction company that's eight hundred thousand dollars just rebuilt the entire condo that they have on the beach and it looks like you're getting all the bills, but you're really building. Uh, so it wasn't really a, they, they, they didn't take the cash as you think sometimes, but what they did is they used the company for personal benefit and they put the bills in the company to kind of try to hide it. And unless you're looking at the actual invoices, you would never see that. That's right. Yeah. Got to look at the details. The devil is in the details. So financials, you talked about financials and I've heard companies do financials. You know, if you have a small company, you might do it once a year. If you do, you know, bigger, maybe once a quarter typically is, you know, monthly financials. But how do you decide if you need monthly, quarterly financials? I mean, well, it just depends on what you're trying to measure. How do you know if you're being successful? What are you trying to do? Um, a lot of times people will do annual financials because they really just need that for their tax return. Right. Like maybe they've got a rental property. It's kind of the same thing every month. There's not a whole lot to see. Do that annually. You know, it's, don't waste the money on looking at it every month. But if you're if you're running an active business that you're trying to manage and you're trying to grow, then you probably need to be looking at it at least monthly. And the other thing about that is that you start to get into a routine and you start to understand better what you're looking at. First time you look at it, it's like reading a different Gibberish. language. Yeah. I Gibberish. Mean, it's not English. It's certainly not English. <laughs> it is a different language. So if, the more often you look at it, the more often 
you'll notice anomalies or you'll you'll know to ask better questions. Okay. So, you know, I hear this, you know, when I was, uh, when I first got started in business with my tanning salons, I was on a cash basis, mm -hmm. uh, accounting cash basis. And then, and then I got a little bit bigger and you get a little bigger and people say, well, you, you know, that's not really according to gap, you know, uh, accrual, we've got to use the accrual method or gap accounting just briefly, you don't have to get into tons of detail on that, but the difference between a cash and a gap accounting. Okay. So Usually you don't need to get into gap unless you have a different audience for these financial statements. So think about who they're for. If you're trying to run your tanning salon, cash is probably going to tell you what you need to know because cash is really king. Cash flow is king. Always, always. So if you don't have money to pay the electric bill, then that's really what you're focused on. When you get into gap financials, you're usually dealing more with um somebody that's doing analysis, somebody that's doing strategy. Maybe you've got investors, maybe you've got an audit that you need to do because of a bank covenant. You know, you've got debt on the on the business and and you're required to have gap financials. Usually there's something has changed where other people are looking at it. And to try to give you an example of what maybe gap versus cash or accrual versus cash, we talked a little bit just earlier about insurance, right? So that's a, an example of an accrual. Maybe you have a six month or a 12 month policy where it's $10,000 and it all hits in June, right? Well, that expense is made to cover the period of the, of the insurance policy. You don't only have insurance during June, so we spread it out over time. So that's one example of okay. an accrual that I think most people. So can you take the ten thousand dollars, divide it by twelve months in the year, and you would, in the financial statement, it would look like you had a uh, insurance expense every single month, but in truth, you really had a ten thousand dollar payment one time in the month of June. Exactly right. Yes. So what it does is it evens out the financials a little bit more. It makes them look more long term as opposed to just looking at every single short period, whether it's a month or. Yeah. So what you're trying to do is match the expense with the benefit of that expenditure. Got it. I'm going to shift now just a little bit and ask you a couple of definition questions, because a lot of times in this, I remember earlier in my career and earlier in my business life, I didn't know how to do all these things or I didn't know what they even what the acronyms uh, meant. But the first thing is setting up a company, right? So you want to have a business and you want to set up a company and you hear this all the time. All you got to do is go out and set up a company. What, what, you know, and, and so a lot of times you think, well, that means buying a franchise or that means starting a business. But when you set up a company, an entity, mm -hmm. right, and then you create an entity name, speak to that. What does that really mean? What are you really doing and how much does that cost? Okay. So the very first thing you have to do is think about what you want to name it. Okay. Uh, the XYZ Corporation. Okay. So we take the XYZ Corporation, then we say, well, where where is it domiciled? Where is your jurisdiction for this entity? Because it's a, it's a thing. It's almost like a living thing. So if you're in Texas, you register it with the Texas Comptroller. If you're in Florida, you register it with the Florida Department of State. Every state has a, a body that requires a registration. So you take the name and then you list it with that, that Department of State and you list the officers. Okay, so then it's public record. So now this is a, an entity that, for legal purposes, has different rights and responsibilities. It can be sued. It can have credit. It can, it can act. It's a business. And then usually the second step is to obtain a federal ID number. Okay. So is that, that the same as the EIN? Yes. Oh, E-I-E-I-O-N? Or what is, what's an E-I-O? Oh, I'm kidding. I'm joking about that. But the E-I-N what, you know, that's what I hear it called a lot, but uh, federal ID number, what, why would you have one of those and why do you need one of those and where do you get one of those? So compare it to a social security number ah, for okay. a person. Okay. So you know, think of your business as a as sort of like a person. So that is not a state thing. That is a federal thing. So that is with the Internal Revenue Service. Okay. So you go then to the Internal Revenue Service and you request a federal ID number. You tell them that you are registered with whatever state you're doing business in. And um, you can actually go to irs.gov and get one. You'll fill out a form called an SS4. <laughs> now we're not speaking English anymore. Yeah. <clears throat> right, new language. So, so you fill you could do you can fill one of those out uh, yourself online. Is there a fee to that? Does it cost money? There's not a fee for the IRS if you do it yourself. Okay. Um, usually there's a fee with your state. You know, it's maybe $150. I think 
sometimes it's as, as high as $800 to register with the state. Okay. You can pay someone to do that for you. And when you get your federal ID number, that means now you become an entity that's probably going to be taxed. Mm -hmm. That's an entity now that you now could have employees where you're going to have to pay employment taxes, right? That's if right. you have employ employees, that's how, that's how those, uh, how, that's really how you get identified with the government really for taxation, right? Is that fair to say, or is it more, it's way more than that? No, that's fair to say. And then, you know, to that end, you can open a bank account. So, you know, bank account. So you get, do you open the bank account before you get your register with the state or do you open the bank account after? Does that matter? Usually you have to do it after. The, those are the documents you'll bring with you to the bank. They need to see it, right? Especially yeah. if it's a company. They want to know business. it's real. Yeah. And they'll want, you know, they also, my banks ask me for operating agreements. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have to have the registration for the state. I have to have my federal registration or my EIN, uh, federal ID, and then I need some kind of an operating agreement. Those three documents are what I get asked to produce uh, to open up a business bank account. Yeah. And along, I have to bring some cash. Uh, some money to get it started. You know, they just don't, they don't put money in there for you. You know, you got to do that yourself. That's right. So you get the bank account and there's, there's a couple other things that you might want to take a look at. And so this happens, you know, people always need clarification on this. And this is, I think where you can really help us. So you hear about um, companies going filing, filing, we're filing, well, who, who are you? Who's all this filing? Are you putting it in a manila folder and putting it in a file cabinet? Or when you guys talk about filing, what are you really talking about? Filing. Well, you've got different requirements for different jurisdictions. So it's important to make yourself a little calendar because it can be very expensive if you miss a filing. Um, so, for instance, if you are registered with the state, you've got to file an annual report typically. And if you miss that deadline, there's a huge penalty. Um and, and that varies by state. So that's one thing. And that's really just updating your mailing address um, and the, the officer so that it's a public record. Then there are filing taxes. And there are a number of different tax returns you can file, Terry. So typically there's a federal filing requirement with the IRS that's annual. And oftentimes there are state tax returns that are for income tax as well. And then Oftentimes, if you're selling a product, you've got to file sales tax returns, and that's that's really important because that's considered a trust tax, which means that you, Terry, could be personally liable for that tax. And so you want to keep track of a calendar for all of these different things. And then if you've got employees, you've got payroll tax filings. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So so how would you know when these dates are? How do you know how? How would anybody know that? Or is that what you hire an accountant for? Is that what you hire a service, you know, an outside uh, uh, accounting services for? Well, that's certainly the quickest way to figure that out is to to hire an accountant that knows all of those rules. There's also most most uh, localities will have a small business development center, and that's a great resource for people, and and that's typically free. You can take a class and we'll go through all of that with you. Okay. So the other piece that happens is, is, you know, just again, because there's different types of, you know, I'll call it financial statements, but you know, you have a P and L what, what is, what does that stand? What is P and L? What? So P and L stands for profit and loss statement, or oh, you'll also hear okay. it called an income statement okay, or a statement of revenue, all kinds of different names, but it basically shows you what, these are your sales. This is what you brought in. These are your expenses, all the cost of doing business. And this is what you're left over with. And that's called net income. Okay. Well, I hear these guys use this term EBITDA. 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 Yes. EBITDA, EBITDA. But EBITDA, forget EBITDA, but EBITDA. So what is what is EBITDA? So that stands for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Okay. So breaking that down into English, it so you want to understand what the business is producing based on its its expenses that are required to operate business, typically cash. So those other things are not um, recurring or they're not cash expenses. So you take those out to understand what the business is really producing, like what cash you can take home in your pocket. So interest, earnings before interest, the interest would be if you had debt on the business and you had to pay interest, that would be, you'd have your operating expenses and your kind of earnings or your profitability, quote unquote, before uh, you had to pay the interest. Mm -hmm. 
So you're looking at that. Like if I were to buy this business and I did not have debt, we would take interest out. Right. Depending on who owns it, you may or may not have that. So you take it out to see what the business is producing. The value. Yeah. Value. So if you want to go through the rest of the list, depreciation and amortization are the way you experience an expense for a, a, a piece of property that is placed in service. So if you've got, you know, leasehold improvements or you buy treadmills, those, all those things, you experience that expense over time and that's called depreciation or amortization. Got it. Balance sheets, right? Everybody looks at the balance sheets and you know, the, the assets and the liabilities and the net equity and, you know, balance sheets though. What, how, how would you define a balance sheet? Right. So that's all your stuff, right? <laughs> like that's your inventory of what you got. So it shows you all your cash, how much cash do you have in the bank? Yep. Um, typically you'll see receivables. So this is what other people owe me. Right. Payables, what I owe other people. Okay. And then you'll see debt if there is any. So those are your liabilities. And then, the difference is, is your equity. So that's, that's basically what you've got. The value. Yeah. It's a value. So if you have, if you have a car and use an analogy, if you had a car and the car was worth $40,000, but you had a car loan at 30,000, uh, your asset would be the car. The liability would be the loan and the equity would be that $10,000 perhaps, or whatever the value of the car is today. Maybe. That's right. Is that yeah. fair to say something like that, that? That's exactly right. You're so good with the analogies, Terry. Yeah. I try to put it in layman's terms so that anybody can can understand that, you know? Okay. Well, we, you, you, you know, you heard about a house, right? Everybody says they have equity in their house. What does that mean? If the house is 300000 and you have a mortgage for two hundred thousand. Mm-hmm. That means there's probably about a hundred thousand dollars of value or equity. Mm-hmm. You can take out a home equity loan against that. You can do different things with it, right? That's kind mm-hmm. of the same thing. So businesses are looked at the same way. Yes. Got it. Okay. Hey, uh, let's wrap it up. And to wrap it up, uh, you, you deal with individual businesses, big, small, uh, all over the place. You have a full service uh, group. What in clo- what are two or three things you say if you were a business person? And what are things that uh, you would want to maybe say, this is a couple uh, pieces of advice or counsel, or maybe a pitfall to avoid? What, what would you tell uh, some of the listeners out there that are starting a business, have a business, and they're thinking about getting an accounting person, accounting firm, mm-hmm. outside services, or just some of those pieces? What, what would you advise or counsel or say, man, make sure you watch out for this? Man, watch out for um, all kinds of things. Talk to people. Don't go it alone. Starting a business is hard, and there are people that will help you if you just ask for help and then be quiet and listen. Just write it down. Listen. Um, if you can find a community of other people that are trying to do the same thing, that are like-minded, there are all kinds of organizations out there. Don't be cheap about that. Join one. You know, they, there are resources. There are coaching resources available. I mean, just go and find it, Google it. Yep. You know, one of the, I would tell you, my, my counsel is, is that a lot of things are foreign in the financial world to people if, because you're, you're good at your profession, but you're not good at business. And so those accounting terms, my advice is, man, ask the question. Don't be embarrassed. Just come out and say, you know, and here's how I do it. I say, could you educate me on this? Instead of saying, I don't know what it is, or I never heard of that before, I'll say, hey, educate me. What does EIN mean? What is the? What are these filings? What do, what do you have to file? What's all this filing you're talking about? I just ask, right? Simple ask. Get over it. Push your ego aside. Know you don't know it. And take, be a student of the game and learn the great game of business. Kristen Brand, uh, uh, great uh, person. If you're interested, you can go to the website, Tuesday with Terry. We'll put some of her contact information to reach out to her professionally. And uh, if you're looking for a good accounting firm uh that might be an opportunity but i just want to say thanks for being here thanks for being a guest on the show and uh if it ain't making money it ain't making sense all right all right bye-bye for now we'll see you next tuesday on tuesday with terry my name's terry i'm your friend Mm